given something like this, what is the fastest way to go from the bottom to the top? There is an escalator and there's stairs. 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 Walking on the escalator. Yes. So think of it as the stairs are hard work and uh, the elevator on an escalator is intelligence. My first decade of the industry, I relied a lot on hard work and intelligence to, uh, and hard work to get my results. The second decade, I realized that there's a lot of uh, knowledge to build on top of. So I realized I have learned and I'm trying to share the knowledge which I have acquired in different forums like this so that uh, you folks have to work less hard. This is a brief uh, introduction. I think of myself as an engineer, learner, speaker, teacher, and writer. Uh, the theory without practice is empty. Practice without theory is this strongly resonates with my belief system. You can uh, find me on LinkedIn, and I write on Medium. Uh, this is a uh, disclaimer. I'm speaking on my personal capacity. My views don't represent my employers, and some of the pictures I used are from Google searches. Uh, okay, this is a simple program to find the fourth largest <coughs> number in a list in an array of integers. This would be a standard way most of you would write. You can think of uh, I can enhance the find fourth max with a find fourth max and replace it. That is a possible enhancement for this piece of code. Similarly, I can replace the sort logic with a different implementation. You can think uh, this program has two different axes of change. So this language is not novel. People have referred to identifying the axis of change and hence applying the single responsibility principle. Similarly, uh, Uncle Bob, who is a well-known speaker, talks about axis optimization. Uh, folks, I couldn't fi uh, find something with subtitles, so please wear. Uh, folks, for those of you who didn't understand, the guy wanted a customized tea. He wanted customized levels of milk, sugar, and decoction. And the provider couldn't provide this, and hence he got mad. Folks, here's given an array of integers, you can sort it in ascending order. That's the first entry. The second entry is sorting it in descending order. Now consider if you have an array of tuples where both elements are integers. You can sort it in the ascending order of the first entry as well as the ascending order of the second entry. Here, you find the descending order of this first entry and the ascending order of the second entry. This is descending on both fronts. Something as simple as sort, if it is a one dimensional array, you can do it in two different ways. If it's an array of two dimensions, you can do it in four different ways. 
So, the axis of variation is where the software can provide pluggability or variability. Now, the, the boolean is ascending. That it has two values, true and false. But choices, different choices, result in very different uh, behavior from the sort thing. So the the uh, the boolean ascending represents two similar constructs, ascending and descending, but they are interchangeable. <laughs> this is the premise of this talk. Now, questions so far, folks, please uh, drop in whenever you have a question. Let's take, I want to make a distinction between a dependency and a variation. There are three uh, methods I'm talking, one which takes sorter as a parameter, one which takes quick sort, another which takes a comparator. M2 is not, does not provide any variability. M3 provides variability. Now, M1, the consumer of this application might care or not care about variability. So, if the consumer does not care about performance, they may use bubble sort. If they care, they can use merge sort, bit sort, any of those. The rest of the talk, I'll speak about different ways of accomplishing variation. The simplest is what I call variation by data. So continuing the earlier example, the choice of boolean determines if it is ascending order or descending order. Similarly, we can be more, I mean, have a more explicit representation of this. We can have a enum uh, called order which has two, two options, ascending and descending and this can be used for solving. This is the other variation I'm calling variation by delegation. Here, the client provides a comparator. Now, the difference is the, the sort routine can, in, uh, can reflect upon the value is true, is false, is equal to ascending or is equal to descending. The same cannot be accomplished here. There cannot be any runtime introspection of the comparator to just have to execute it. This is the other thing. Now back to a real world, uh, real world example to uh, illustrate the terminology. That's called a wheel hub where a wheel is fastened to. This is the specification of a tire, the width, the height, the, pre uh, the tire pressure and so on. These are manufacturers who, who uh, manufacture tires. So going back, I would name that the variation point, this the specification and this, uh, these are the variants. This is the terminology I'm going to use in this talk. I may use the word variation interchangeably with the specification. In uh, most uh, paradigms, the two variation points are. The so objective of doing excess of variation is uh, how to monitor and fix the performance, or is it to how do you design more extensible software? Okay. Now, as a software provider, I may choose to provide different uh, behavior like a sort routine, different orders, or I can do different performance. I can choose whatever dimensions, but I'm giving more than one option to, to my clients. The tea maker in the video I showed, he granted nothing. He just had tea with no, uh, no variability. So as a programmer, you have to identify where your clients may require variations and plugin. And the plugin is either, like I said, via data or via delegates. So in O, 
there are two kinds of variation points, basically the fields of objects or parameters to methods. Like I said, specification itself or the variation can be done via data or objects. Uh, especially in the world of O, the, the word data is not defined. So I'm going to use this notation. Data is something which has state, but no behavior. It is approximately equal to Java beats. The only method it provides are getters and setters. Nothing more, nothing less. All the data, all the elements of a data element are open for introspection. I'm going to borrow notations from the function programming world. Data can be created by combining other data types. There are two flavors, one I'm showing here. It is a node and a list. These together form one data type. And the other notation where it is this or this which defines this data type. So list is either a none or it's a concatenation of a node and another list. Um, folks, how many of you have visited data packets in Python? Mind explaining? Mind explaining? Okay, so the visitor uh, data packet is when? So, um, in my understanding, um, visitor is when you um, define a, a class uh, to borrow from O, a class with the responsibility of um, decorating or delegating a certain functionality of it. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm using examples from the Java stream library over here. Java stream has a map function which takes another function. This function is executed on the elements of the stream. This is one way of dealing with uh, data where a server system deals with the logic plugged in by the client system. So who is the visitor here? The stream is the visitor. The function is a visitor. So I, I mean the stream capability is providing variation by exposing the variation point variation as a visitor by implementing the design pattern. No, the visitor is the design pattern. The next flavor is what is called tree and destructuring. Consider the class to do. It accepts a function which returns all of its elements t1 and t2. And these can be acted upon by the uh, client provided logic. The difference is here the stream is not exposing every element at one go. Here, the tuple is exposing all of its element at one go for its consumers. Folks, uh, I assume most of you are Java programmers or C sharp. How many of you are familiar with some types? Some type? Is it accumulation uh, or aggregation or collection? It is this or that. Okay. So enums are true or false. Short, I mean tall or short. Here you can have uh, types which are enumerated. A list is of type none, or is it a, is a concatenation of a, an, uh, another list none? Now similarly, similar to the visitor pattern. Here you can have a match function which takes two, two of these and depending upon whether it is a none or a concatenation of a list, it will invoke the right logic. Let me know if this makes sense. Uh, plug, in for, plug for my course. 
these ideas are from the functional programming world. They are not well known in the Java world. So I have written a couple of blogs where these constructs can be employed in the Java world. Some types are, can be employed in businesses, at a business level as well. So if you buy something on a Spiggy or a Amazon or a Flipkart, you can pay by credit card or cash or debit card or net bank. You will not employ more than one but for the same transaction. So this is an example of what happens in the real Now given a payment, we can, given a payment instrument, we have to uh, debit the instrument. We may have to reverse the, the payment. We may have to use it for uh, subject that to fraud detection and so on. So the takeaway from this slide is for the same uh, type, we can have different enhancements and all of this can be done without modifying the payment construct. So here are some examples. So by, by wise choice of uh, the variations, you can take a list and find the number of elements in a list. Given a list of integers, you can find the sum of all elements. Given a list and an element, you can check if an element is present in a list. So, with the list construct allows different variations without having to uh, change any of its own logic. So, I, I explained the visitor pattern, I spoke about the deconstruction pattern, I spoke about the pattern matching. All of these patterns can be employed if the variation is by data. Now, I'll speak about a couple of things. This is a pattern called the decision table. So you can have a bunch of columns. And based upon these values, you can output uh, fields like a fee or a alert. Now, your client can define the decision table. The actual entries in each of this is not hard coded into the code. So X and Y can be inputted, uh, can be input at the runtime and you can execute it. So without having to recompile, you support different variations of this table. This is what I am calling as variation as instruction. Now variation can, it, can be schema as well. In a database, in a relational database, you can define tables at the runtime. And you can insert and um, perform your operations on these tables at the runtime. The database is not recompiled each time you support a new data, new table. Similarly, workflow definitions are another flavor. So, okay, this one. Let me go an example from the uh, Flipkart world. Flipkart works with third party sellers. They may have inventory, they have times where they are serviceable, say you can pick up uh, merchandise from my outlet from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. A different supplier can have different timings, different address, different capability, blah, blah, blah. Now all of these, so Flipkart will not rewrite their software to support a new supplier. So this information is, is what I'm calling, this style is what I'm calling as variation as contact. Okay. What's the difference between uh, variation as contact and variation as schema? Variation of schema uh, variation as, as schema. Here, 
I only spoke about the DDL. The DML conforms to the DDL. Workflow will conform to the workflow definition. So you have two parameters. One is the variation. The two levels of variation. First level is a schema. The second level is the instance of a schema. That is not true for variation as contract. The visiting in mean, the hours of a business is there's only one level of variability. So folks, when it comes to variability by delegation, the predominant way is polymorphism. There are different kinds of polymorphism, nominal, structural, ad hoc, generics. I assume most of you are familiar with these. This is how you achieve vari variation by delegation. Okay, another real world example. All of the tennis balls here are effectively the same. Almost the same color, same size, same shape. Now, uh, the, and then the right to it is, I'm not sure what it call this, some makeup kit. Each of these color cakes have the same uh, volume, same height, all the dimensions are same, but they vary in the color. In this example over there, over here are some macarons. They have the same sh uh, shape. But they differ in color as well as taste. And the last is uh, this toy called potato head. You have different option of eyes, different option of noses, different option of spectacles, and moustaches and so on. So starting from the top, as you go in a, a clockwise manner, you see the amount of variability in just constructs increases. One takeaway is there are parts of your software where variability is important and there are parts where it will be of relevance. So I'm going to use the terminology of a common part and the variation part. The tennis balls have completely common, nothing variable, but as you go clockwise manner, the variability increases. Here I'm going to list a couple of uh, design patterns. Here, the variants are clients of the same part. A classical example is inheritance. All subtypes may consume functionality from the base classes. The next flavor is what I'm calling uh, variant as server. So, how many of you know the state pattern? What is the state pattern? The state pattern magic. Yeah. Allow an object to alter its behavior on its event. Like when you are having the different event type, like when you are in the previous you are taking the ball. Uh, each ball like ping pong game, like you keep on putting the event. It's happen on the event. Thank you. So, there is part of a logic which is same across different states. But there is a logic which is a bit changes in each state. So, this is an example where you encapsulate the same thing in the same part construct and the variations were at where the state variants go in. Another is the variance as server. Uh, how many of you have the template? method pattern or the pattern the pattern. So in the template method pattern, a lot of the logic is coded in the base class, but not all of it. This is accomplished by uh, subclassing the template and plugging in the missing pieces. So there is another manifestation of this pattern. Folks, why does variability matter? 
Uber is a platform where they, they don't rewrite their platform each time they add a new driver or a new rider. Hadoop is not rewritten each time there's a new map job or a reduced job. LinkedIn does not rewrite itself to add every uh, new employee on it. So figuring out who, what are the dimensions of variation, having a significantly big, uh, big enough same part and supporting high number of variables is what made these businesses successful. So the techniques I, I spoke, um, I uh, refer to in this talk will help you realize such kind of variability at a software level. Yeah. I'm done. Any questions? Introducing variability. Mm -hmm. Introducing uh, large amount of variants means the complexity will grow. Is it true? It will increase the complexity by how much your education is gone. The number of variants typically is not, but if you have more access of variability, then it becomes higher. So uh, the more it becomes complex, right? becomes difficult to test. Mm. If you have good abstractions, okay. it is harder. Mm. Is it going to be hard? No, it's not impossible, right? But uh, it's definitely going to be hard. Yes. So, is there any rules or some rules that says where should you stop adding more access? Look, Uber could have rewritten their code for it and they add a new ride. They chose not to because that was the value add of the system. The pain of supporting variability they undertook to in return for growth in their business. There's a judicious call saying that I'm going to introduce this dimension of variability in my software. Is it good enough for me? So I gave an example very in the beginning of a simple sort logic. You can't write eight different flavors of sorting. You cannot. So you provide a comparator and capture all of this in the comparator implementation. So I'm saying it is, I mean, the risk and use rate is of Thank Most of this, these platforms are mm -hmm. business platforms. 
we can build platforms uh, which are more in, uh, inside the company. Data platforms are an example. In my previous talk, I spoke about how Google Docs can be built as a platform. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things I want to promote is engineers are not just cold monkeys. Mm -hmm. We can add value to the business, we can provide, we can build powerful software which can scale in multiple dimensions. Okay. So, I'm a proponent of think beyond today's requirements, make it parameterizable, pluggable, variable, so that when the business changes, you are ready. Okay, thank you. Any references where we can learn more about these topics? Uh, I read about this. My blog post, you'll find about this. I found, I put some links in this as well. Uh, as a concept applies both horizontally and vertically. As in, oh, yes. when you are writing as a programmer, when you are writing a small script, there are excessive variations. Mm -hmm. When you are designing an architecture, there is no yes. So, uh, my experience has been that there is a fine balance between uh, specific script that you write and the generic implementation that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, that only comes by uh, uh, you know judicious decision making, as you said. And gray hair. Yeah, gray hair. Um, so, uh, given that gray hair is not something we can quickly achieve. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, as I said, right, if you, if, uh, if you talk about thumb groups, right, and you said thinking beyond what we have today, mm -hmm. right, I think sometimes that can be a bit dangerous because I've seen uh, programmers who try to do, to try to make a very small requirement generic and, and you know, bloat the software. So, have you? Do you, uh, would you advise caution along those lines? Because that balance is a difficult thing to achieve. Look, there is premature generalization yeah. and there is late generalization. So here I speak of If you are writing a sort routine which supports both ascending and descending, you identify this duplication and then figure out I can deduplicate this. The way to deduplicate is by introducing an axis of variation. So, I am a big proponent of uh, limiting myself to current requirements, but doing it well. The way I train myself is, wherever there is duplication, I have to deduplicate my code. Over time you realize there are so many different things in your code, and you start deduplicating, your code becomes this small but very powerful. No, I agree. Um, but, but some some say there is a rule of three. Like uh, that is not very normal. No, no, I'm it, saying no, it can be seven, it can be two and a half, or it can be. I know. Yeah, I mean, uh, unless it, uh, the same thing repeats three times, you don't generalize it. So Look, that is a subjective thing. Yeah, I know. The so number three is subjective. Yeah. I don't think the answer variation is subjective; it's an objective. Right. But I'm. Just, more often, we engineers are not trained to uh, to deduplicate. It requires skill. It requires understanding. It, it, it requires understanding of design patterns. It's not familiar. I was not familiar as much as what I am today four years ago until I was introduced to functional programming. Yeah. It's not part of the curriculum. Also. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Another thing is, let's say, this is one example which is much more simple for generic uh, advisory. Mm -hmm. Same case, this uh, design to machine learning. Okay. How, how good can you synchronize or give an example for a machine learning? I am not a machine learning expert. Not like but I agree. I know, what I know is, uh -huh. for different Different algorithms perform different for different sizes of data. Okay. Say you are doing clustering. Mm -hmm. The different algorithms which perform different different sizes of data. That is where, and as your business grows, mm -hmm. if you provide pluggability of your algorithms or strategies, mm -hmm. then we can reuse with a limited uh, cost of change.
That's a model for sure. So something you have to draw the line between permeability comes at a cost. Uh, you need to draw the line between over engineering and permeability. Is that even a requirement? Because you don't write software just for the sake of it for fun, right? You do it especially if you're part of some software. So you you do it for solving a particular problem. Okay. Great question. Would you write sort within this method? Or do you keep sort in a different different method? Why? We keep sort on the same process. Why? That is because you might there could be 10 different places in your code where you No, can even if it is a first time, is there value in, in encapsulating sort logic elsewhere? Yeah, Why? Reusability. Reusability. Yeah. Instead of having one piece of one uh, one capability, you have two capabilities. So repeating to what I, uh, I said earlier, identify. Don't uh, you may not want to introduce variability when there's only one consumer or one flavor. So if quicksort was a, would suffice for your algorithm. Stick with quicksort. But if you realize that there are two flavors, then choose the sort dimension. This is applicable in most scenarios, not all. I mean, as engineers, we are exposed to different kinds of scenarios. What works in a startup may not work in a big company. What works in a startup in day one may not be relevant in day 100. This is where the human element itself comes to the picture. But I repeat myself, more often than not, we under-engineer our systems. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I will have to thank you for introducing me such a unique thought process to the key design. Uh, I am solving one problem in like my angle. So I would like to know your thought process, your approach. There is an existing system that has been messed up. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. That, that is very obvious. Like very hard to think that that has been messed up. So what is your So what's your approach to kind of uh, make it reusable at the same time? Make it uh, adaptable enough so that in future cases we don't end up messing it also. Okay. Like a existing system should also be working. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we should make mature enough so that uh, over the some years it is reusable. It mm -hmm. is working. Thank you, Arpan. Arpan, in my 23 years in the industry, I have built, I guess, seven platforms. And all seven platforms were reverse engineered from existing code. So, I come to the voice code rule. Okay. Voice code rule tells you, it's a, from the scouts. Wherever they go, they leave the place cleaner than what it was before. So, if you read some code and find a refactoring uh, deduplication, a simplification, a uh, variable rename, don't. And if you will be surprised how, uh, if you keep doing it for six months, you will be surprised how much the code will change. So, like I said, I have done seven to eight uh, platforms by reverse engineering legacy applications. So, none of this had an end goal of building a platform. I was just cleaning up, cleaning up, cleaning up, and then boom, platform I reached. Now, my earliest platforms are not as powerful as the later platforms. Because I have identified over the years the various axes of generation, uh, variability. So, it is not just a piece of software, it is how good the programmer is that determines the output. Me being here trying to talk a forum like this is to spread the ideas. What came to me in the 23rd year might reach you in the third year of your career or the second year of your career. Hopefully, you will become better as a career. Thank you. Folks, the video of most updates. <laughs> Going once.
Thank you.